Last Sunday we introduced the concept that the New Testament church was led by a group of men that are called different names in Paul's writings. Elders, overseers, or bishops, depending on your translation, and pastors. And uh, when I say introduce that, that was part of introducing this series. I've talked through this in Titus and other places that we've been in the New Testament. This week we want to see that elders are protecting the church by equipping the saints to know truth from falsehood. That's vitally important because we can make a lot of dumb decisions based on falsehood rather than doing the right thing that's based on truth. Sometimes, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes following falsehood is easier for the moment. But in the long run, you need to build your life on truth. There are two offices still existing in the local church. The office of elder, which does the shepherding. That's the main function of an elder is to shepherd. And then that of deacons focuses on serving the physical needs of people. There are these two offices in the local church. Now Paul calls them overseers. These elders, remember in Acts 20, he calls for the elders from Ephesus to come down and he says, God, the Holy Spirit, has made you overseers of the congregation, overseers of the church there in Ephesus. They have that responsibility. It says you are to feed and shepherd. You're to shepherd. You're to care for them. And I've given you some references if you're getting the bulletin. There's some references in the scripture to where this is, or you can write these down. Now, the writer of the book of Hebrews, which I take to be different from Paul, uses a term called uh, translated rulers. Rulers. And he's describing the same office of that of elders. Uh, two of the men in Jerusalem who were elders were sent to Antioch to explain what happened in Jerusalem at that council. And they're referred to as leaders, rulers of the church in Jerusalem. Same word, same concept that he's doing. But regardless of what you call them, the office of the elder is the same office in the church. Deacons are focusing on serving people. That's their focus. In particular, trying to take care of the needs of widows. Clyde is going to, in two weeks, talk more about that. Talk about what the office of deacon or the responsibility of deacon was in the local church. Now, we're going to Acts chapter 20. So if you turn to your Bible or find it on your electronic device or however you do it uh, to see the scriptures. But we want to see in Acts chapter 20, verses 28, 29, and 30, some truths about these elders. Let's read it, Acts chapter 20, verses 28, and I'll go ahead and read down to verse 31. Paul says, So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church which he purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. There's that word for overseer, leaders. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth, in order to draw a following. Watch out! Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you will open our hearts and minds to your word. Father, your truth will stand forth to us. Lord, that many of the men in this place will see the need to step up and be leaders. Do what it takes to become the kind of men that can defend the church and defend the truth and be a witness to the world. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's talk about what the Ephesian elders were to do. What were going to be their job? First of all, he says in verse 29 that they were to guard themselves and God's people. One of the first things you've got to do if you're going to be an elder if you're going to shepherd the people of God, if you're going to look out for the congregation, look out for the souls of the people in the church, you've got to watch out for yourself, first of all. You've got to make sure that you're right, 
that you're taking the truth in, that the Word of God is making an impact on your life. Every time you point a finger that way, at least three fingers are pointing back this way. Sometimes four, depending on how you're handling it. So everything that you're going to tell others, this is what you need to do. You need to be an example. You need to guard yourself because all of us get dumb ideas. Right? Men, do we get dumb ideas? Like this is really dumb. It was fun, but it was a dumb idea. Sometimes you do that. You've got to say, okay, sometimes you listen to people that are foolish. There's a favorite poem I like by Joe Bailey, a writer for one of the scripture companies, the curriculum companies. He wrote in a poem, Psalms of My Life, said, Lord, I'm such a stupid sheep. Lord, I follow other shepherds, even other stupid sheep. Well, that's a pretty good description. We don't want to follow other shepherds. We don't want to follow other stupid sheep and then say to folks, come this way. No, we want to be careful that we're guarding ourselves. We're watching out for the ideas that come into our mind. We're watching out for the habits that we allow to become habits in our life that aren't godly habits. And we need to do that first of all. We need to pay attention to ourselves on a daily basis, watching our lives while we're watching the lives of others. If we're watching out for ourselves, we also need to be watching out for others. There is a movement, an idea abroad in our country today, that you shouldn't watch out for other people. If you're trying to interfere with somebody else's life, why are you meddling in their life? Well, because we care about them. We're not trying to say you can't do this. We're trying to say you're dumb if you do. Not dumb if you do that. That's not nice. Stupid's a better word. No. Uh, we're trying to say it's dangerous for you to do this. It's really going to ruin your life if you go this way. Yeah, you may have the freedom in the United States to do that, but that is a dead-end street you're going down. That's not the way to life. You're not experiencing eternal life. You're experiencing a death style, not a lifestyle. We need to be able to tell folks, look, this is not the way you should go, particularly in the church. You need people in the church who are going to tell you the truth. You're just about to mess up your life, your family, by holding this unbiblical idea, doing this unbiblical practice. It's kind of like watching out for scams online. If you do a lot of online stuff, or if you watch television, either one. If you, if you don't do either one of those, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but every now and then there'll be a scam alert. Here's the latest scam. Here's how people are getting your personal information so they can get in your bank account and get your money. Nowadays, all you got to do is register at DMV, and you're in. You know, they'll get you. But uh, so now you've got to have somebody watch because somebody is trying to scam you. You got to get the information out. That look, this scam is going down. People are asking you to do something that we don't think you ought to be doing. They're asking you for personal information. They're asking you to pay money to the federal government, and they're not the federal government. They're doing all kinds of scam. That's why you have these scam alerts that come across the new news because they're trying to let you know. This, this is the latest one that's out there right now. Here's what people are doing right now, trying to get you money. They change them up occasionally. Well, there are scammers that are trying to get into the church. There are scammers that are trying to put false ideas about what the church is around us. Let me share one. I was coming somewhere up this way, and I had the radio on in the truck, listening. And there was uh, listening to uh, one of the stations and had a, uh, apparently a prophetess speak, or a preacher, and she was saying, you know, about Jeremiah. Said, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1. God asked Jeremiah, what do you see? He said, you need to be careful. Jeremiah may have had the, the, the thought in his mind, let me lie to God. Let me tell God something just for what he might want to hear instead of saying what I see. But he said, you've got to be careful that your vision that you put out there that you tell God, and you tell me, this is what I see. And then it'll come true that it'll happen to you. If you're familiar with Jeremiah chapter 1, which I was because 
I was working through Jeremiah in my Bible reading, and I thought, that's not right at all what you saw. You tell God, you know, God did say you've seen well, but I think he saw an almond tree. What do you see? You see, there's a, a scam coming into church that whatever you envision, whatever you see, then God's going to fulfill it. Whatever it is, you need money. If you can see money, you can see yourself being wealthy. If that's your vision, if that's, what, that's not what the Bible means by vision. A vision has to be anchored in the Word of God. It has to be anchored in what God is in. Jeremiah says, I saw this. God said, here's what it means. You see, if you don't have the here's what it means from God, you know what you see. You're just seeing yourself in the way you'd like to be, wealthy. God says, I, I don't mind you being wealthy, but that's not the way I'm going to make you holy. What I really want you to be is holy, because I want you to be like me. There are these scams that are out there. We need to guard the congregation. There are times the pastor has to tell you, this is out there. I wish I knew the lady's name. I just tuned into the broadcast. I wasn't listening for five or ten minutes, and I didn't get the thing. And I really did not want to mark it down that much, but I guess I should have to say, look, here's one that's false. She's got a dumb idea. This is not at all what a vision means. A vision is anchored in Scripture. They were to guard themselves. There are false ideas that are coming. We're going to talk about that a little more in, in detail in just a moment. Secondly, he says, verse 1, not only you guard yourself with God's people, but you feed and shepherd God's flock. That's the New Living Translation of the word to shepherd. What well, we know from Ephesians 4, a shepherd is also a teacher. The idea is you've got to teach people the word of God. You've got to make sure that they understand what the word of God means. When we preach the word here, the goal of preaching the word is so you can go back on Sunday afternoon and sit down and read that passage and say, yeah, I now understand what that means. If you can't do that, one of us has not done our job. Either I've not taught you or you've not listened. Now, either one is possible. But we've got to make sure that people know the word of God because that's the only thing we have that we can say that is truth. It's God. You've got to shepherd them. God has selected the analogy of shepherding sheep in order to communicate the way his word is to be taught in the world today. It's his choice. Now the problem with that is we don't know nothing about sheep. So it makes it a little odd. And there are analogies we can use to substitute for that, but you've got to remember the original analogy. You've got to go back to that analogy. God chose you shepherding and sheep for a purpose. There were certain things he wanted to get across to us that aren't. I've heard in cattle. Done, I've watched people shepherd sheep. They don't work the same. Herding sheep, you saw them get them going. I, I love to watch sheepdog trials. That was when you go to sheepdog trials and the shepherd just whistle or just make a look and the dog will move the sheep around the ring and through this gate and around here and through there and then finally put them in the pen and shepherd just close the pen. Very quiet. Very quiet. You see rawhide? That would not work with sheep. It works with cows. So there's differences in that. So one of the things we've got to do is we've got to learn and study and watch and see how do, how do sheep work? And how does a shepherd work sheep? in order to understand the analogy, to understand what Jesus is saying. If you really want to understand what this is about, read John chapter 10, the Gospel of John chapter 10, and you'll find Jesus expanding upon that analogy and helping us to understand it. Number three, he says, not only are you to guard yourselves with God's people and feed and do that, but you've got to remember you are a Holy Spirit appointed. When you're in the position of being shepherding the flock of God, the people of God, the church of God, you got to remember, no matter how you got there, the Holy Spirit put you there. Now, we don't know all the process of selecting elders. We're going to look at some of that later. We know that at first, first time we run across this, Paul appointed some elders in every church. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in the church. Now, we don't know how they picked the elders, how they were selected. We don't know. 
maybe as time went on, all the elders got together and decided, well, this man is now ready. He's met the qualifications, and let's put him in position to do that. Uh, some may have been nominated by the congregation. We just don't know how it all worked out. But whatever the process that got you here as an elder, as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a leader of the church, you're here because the Holy Spirit has put you in that position. The Holy Spirit has appointed you in that position. You know who you're responsible to? God. Because that's really who puts you in the position. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires to be an overseer, he desires to be an elder, he decides, desires to shepherd the flock of God, he needs to recognize that if you get that position, it's because the Holy Spirit has put you in that position. And you're responsible to him for what you do and what you say. And you better be working with the Holy Spirit or it's going to be a very bad experience for you and for others. Why did they need to know this? Well, he goes on to say, his church purchased with his own blood. The people at the church at Ephesus were valuable to God. They were so valuable to God that Jesus Christ came and shed his blood on the cross so they could be saved and brought into the church. That's how precious these people were to God. We need to understand that Christ shed his blood for your souls. Sink that in just a minute. Christ shed his blood for your soul. That makes you valuable to God. You must be guarded fed and shepherded by men who understand that's the responsibility they've been given. They're caring. Hebrews says they watch for your souls. We need men to take that seriously. Why? Why is that important? Well, because wolves are coming. Paul is telling these men, you need to understand that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Now I want you to understand that tasks are nothing new. Paul had experienced them. Paul writes to, in 1 Timothy 3, which is, written, is after this, apparently in writing. Paul writes several years later, perhaps three or four or five years later, when I left from Macedonia, I urge you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. You need to understand that what Paul is predicting here came true. He knew the wolves were coming. We ought not to get discouraged when we hear of people defecting from the faith, turning their back on Christ and his salvation by grace. It's serious. It has to be addressed, but we've got to recognize this is nothing new. It always happens that way. Paul had encountered this, perhaps through uh, some men by the name he talks about it in uh, 1 Timothy 1.20. He talks about two men, one by the name of Hymenaeus and the other Alexander. It's possible these two men had once been elders at the church there. Paul said, I had to deal with them. I had to turn them over to Satan that their soul might be saved. In other words, he put them out of the protection of the church. To them outside of the church, outside of the communion of the Holy Spirit, outside of God's protection, said, well, let Satan deal with them. They won't listen to anybody else. You're out. You can go live in the world until you repent. If you don't, well, maybe God will save your soul some other way. Keep you from turning completely down this path toward heresy and false teaching. Jesus had encountered false teaching when he taught. Remember, we went through Matthew. Remember all the false teaching he had to deal with? Don't get alarmed because there's false teaching. Timothy is not to get discouraged. He's to confront false teaching. Paul is saying to these elders, you need to watch because these guys are coming. They're coming into the church. Primarily, their attacks are against the Holy Scriptures. They're against the Scriptures. John 17, 17, we read it earlier. God's word is truth. Uh, ESV, it says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you. There's no other way to be made holy than through the Bible. 
Sanctified into truth. Your word is truth. Sanctified needs to make holy. You make, you're made holy by the truth, not by error. You're made holy by the truth. God's word is truth. This is why the world is attacking the word of God. Keep your finger in Acts and go back to Genesis chapter 3. I told you this is nothing new. This is the old serpent's approach in the garden. Genesis 3, 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say? You know what that is? That's God's word. Did God really say? You must not eat from the true fruit of any of the trees in the garden. You see what he's beginning to do? He's beginning to put doubt her mind about God's word because if you get you to doubt God's word you get you to doubt God maybe God is lying to you maybe God is holding something back from you maybe when God says don't go down this path it's because he doesn't want you to know what's down that path but really what it is is God wanting to keep you from dying spiritually and physically running your family and bringing all the corruption and problems you have in this world. He's trying to keep you from that. But the question is, are you really going to follow God's word? Do you believe God's word? Alyssa Childers, in a book called Another Gospel, where she recounts the attempts of her pastor to begin to encourage doubt and unbelief among the select group of their church, he asked this question. Got a small group in the church. Is there anyone here, this is the pastor asking, is there anyone here who believes that Adam and Eve were literal people? She said it was the beginning, it was the beginning every week. He challenged the existence of people like Moses, Abraham, Jonah, and David. He challenged the authorship of the Gospels and the validity of the virgin birth. And he praised those who didn't know what they believed and gazed with perplexed wonderment at those who expressed any kind of certainty. You know what he's doing? He's saying you really ought to doubt whether the word of God is true, whether the message of God is true. This was a pastor of the church he was in. And he had invited certain people into this group, a more progressive group. And he's teaching them, you know, you really can't believe the word of God. In fact, he'll come down, she talks about later, come down to the place where he says, I'm not really sure there is a God. It's the pastor of her Christian church. Paul says you need to be careful. There are wolves who are going to come in. Yeah, there are people who are coming into the church trying to cause doubt about the word of God rather than trying to help people understand the truth of the Word of God. Not only are these attacks against the Gospel, but if you're attacking, attacked against the Bible, you're attacking the Gospel. Because the only thing we know about the Gospel, for sure, is what's said in the Bible. If you go out on the street and ask people coming out of churches, what is the Gospel? You're going to get a bunch of different answers. Many of them are wrong. The Gospel is we care for the poor and needy. That's the gospel of the poor. That's the gospel Jesus taught. The gospel is, and you're going to get all kinds of nonsense answers. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2 was written about the church at Ephesus. Jesus giving a prophecy toward the end of the uh, Christian, first Christian era, before the end, 90, 95 AD, sometimes along that was the, the time frame that we're looking at. And Jesus says this to the church at Ephesus. Now listen, go in Paul's words. This is coming. Listen to what Jesus says. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You examine the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. Now why is that important? Well, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, the name of Jesus. 
And Jesus selected certain men to be apostles. To go forth as his authorized representatives to declare to the world, this is the good news by which you can be saved. It's Jesus Christ who died on the cross, put there by God's plan, but through the hands of evil men. He died there on the cross. He rose again on the third day by the power of God to demonstrate that this is the one by whom God will save the world. If you put your trust in him, you will be saved. God will save you. Now, he selected men to do that. First, we know there were 12 men. And then one of them defected. Now, 12 from 1 leaves 11. That's advanced math, I know. But you should be impressed that I'm able to do that. But they had to select someone else. So, in Acts chapter uh, 1, we find them selecting a guy. The process they went through, we'll talk about that later. But... Uh, they selected another one so that on the day of Pentecost, which was coming, when they stood up, there'd be 12, because there are 12 tribes of Israel, it's important to have 12 apostles. They selected men who knew the life of Jesus, who were able to testify from the baptism of John until he was taken up into heaven, we saw Jesus. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, there were about 500 men who qualified at that time. Acts tells us there were two. Uh, they picked up these two men who from here to here could stand up and tell. But there were 500 who had seen, who knew Jesus, and had seen the risen Lord rise from the dead. They had seen him. They were eyewitnesses at the time Paul was writing 1 Corinthians, at the time that John was writing the book of the Revelation, had seen that vision. There were a lot fewer of them because people died, even apostles. And so there were a lot of people that had not met the requirement of 1 Corinthians 9 1 that they had seen the risen Lord. Paul was one of them. Jesus had appeared to him on the Damascus Road. He had seen the risen Lord and it converted his life. He was one of those who had seen the risen Lord. As a prophet, one also checks an apostle in regard to their doctrine. Are they teaching? What is true? Are they in alignment with what has been taught about Jesus in the gospel? Are they telling the truth? If it was not the apostles' teaching that the whole church steeped itself in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, they, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. If you're not in line with the apostles' doctrine, and Paul at one point wasn't sure whether he was, he was getting some blowback on his gospel message. So he went to Jerusalem and met with some of the key people because he wasn't sure, am I teaching what the original apostles were teaching? He found that he was. It gave him great confidence. Galatians chapter 1, he talks about that. You've got to be in line with the doctrine, plus you also have to have seen the risen Christ. If either one of these aren't true, you're not a true apostle, you're a false apostle. There are a lot of people born around our world today who say, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I wonder about that for two reasons. Number one, all the people who actually saw Jesus that we know of are dead. So how can you be an apostle? Well, you would not believe the number of folks in churches that are leaving their churches to go follow these apostles. They're young, they're hip, most of them have beards really look, you know, they look for them. And they're claiming we're apostles and you ought to follow us. We've got apostolic authority. We are apostles. And Paul writes to Ephesians and said, one thing you've done good, you found out those, you tested those who said they're apostles, you found them to be false, and you put them out of the church. We need to be aware that today, I'm not talking about way in the past, 2,000 years, we're talking about today. There are people pretending to be apostles. There are people pretending to have a word from God. They're prophets of God, and they're not. But there are a whole lot of other people that are pretending to teach the Bible, and they're not teaching the Bible. They're not teaching what the Bible says. They're pulling an idea, and then they fill it in with their ideas. That's not true. You need to be aware of that. And we need men that know that and are able to stand up against that because people are coming from the outside against Bible-centered church Trying to get you to believe junk. Junk doctrine instead of true doctrine. 
Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verse 29, he said, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. But even worse, even some men from among your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to gain a following. Not only are there wolves coming from without, there'll be wolves that rise up within the church. I kind of imagine the different elders looking at one another. One is it him. Paul said you need to guard yourselves. You need to watch because there may be people in the group that have got some false ideas. One of which is they need to have your own following. Let me give you an example of this. There are a lot of people that take the word like resurrection. Say Jesus rose from the dead. And then they'll turn around and say, you know, there isn't any way a body can rise from the dead. You say, Pastor, who would, who would do that? Read 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is answering the group that's teaching that very thing. They're saying there can't be, there's no way you can have a body that you put in the ground it decays or maybe it gets eaten by sharks at sea or whatever happens to it. And there's no way these people are coming back. And yet he said, if you say that, how can even Christ have risen from the dead? You're not matching up the, the stupidity you're putting out with the truth of the gospel. And so they're putting this, now listen to what they're doing. They were putting this forth as though this was true. Obviously, it's obvious. You ever seen anybody rise from the dead? You ever seen anybody risen from the dead? I mean, without coffee. I mean, you know, somebody that really died and they wrote, no, you've never seen that, so it can't be. I mean, stuff dies in the case, it can't come back. And they were teaching that. And they were saying, how foolish to believe that a body, that God can bring that person back in, in bodily form. That body is scattered all over the ocean. How could that possibly, they were teaching that, as, you know. And then turning around, they said, do you not realize that you can't say Jesus died and rose again if you hold to what you're teaching? We know Jesus died and rose again. Over 500 of us have seen him. We know it happened. And you're saying it can't happen. It did happen. And you're limiting the power of God to put a body back together. Now, Paul, I don't think at this point in his life knew about DNA. One good thing about living in a modern scientific age, we can look at DNA and say there's a specific pattern, specific DNA for you. Not us, for you. There's a DNA that God can use. He, it's specific, and he can put your body back together, unique from everybody else in the world. It's in there. It's encoded in your cell. It's unique. God, that's no problem. All God's got to do is take one cell. Boom. He knows. Well, he didn't even have to take one cell, but he knows the pattern. He set it up. He's the one that designed it. It's no big deal. If God is, then of course God can raise the dead. Of course he can give you a body. Not only a body that looks like you look now, but a body that's going to last for eternity. You're going to be what you're supposed to be for eternity. It'll last you forever. God can do that. You're not only discounting the word of God by this foolishness, but they were discounting the very fact that God is able. By the way, that is a fundamental falsehood in all of these cults and false teaching, they miss out on God and his power. False teachers seek to destroy the church. They will not spare the flock. These guys coming from within, they're going to destroy, just like the ones on the outside, they're going to just, their goal is to destroy the flock, destroy the church. The church. I understand that when wolves attack, they often don't make a kill and sit down and eat that kill. When dogs or sheep, wolves get in among sheep and they get a taste for that, they'll keep kill sheep after sheep after sheep after sheep. And then they might go back and eat more. They get to where they love killing the sheep. It's just a delight to them. That's the way false teachers are. They don't believe in God. They're not sure there is a God. They're not sure Christ rose from the dead. And the more people they get to doubt that, the better they feel about it. And they call themselves, I'm a pastor, a 
I saw a guy the other day said, you know, somebody asked him, does it bother you that a lot of pastors have changed their title from pastor to life coach? He said, no, I'm thrilled to death because they're not pastors. At least they're being honest about who they are. He said they're coming in, they're going to try to destroy, they're going to try to create doubt to destroy faith because Hebrews 11 tells us this, and it is impossible to please God without faith. They can destroy faith. They can stop you from believing. If they can get you to submit your logical mind, your limited knowledge above God's unlimited knowledge and his divine logic, then they've got you in a position of doubt because you're judging God and you're saying, if God can't make it make sense to my limited brain, then he must not be God. And we don't think through it in those terms. We forget about it. We just say, well, you know, I have doubts about it. Do you doubt that God is able? That an all-powerful, omniscient, good God, all power that he could do this? Well, no, of course he could. That's by definition what he, after all, how did he make the world? He spoke and it happened. He's got that kind of power. If you believe in that kind of God, all this other stuff stands out as foolish nonsense. I can't do it, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. God can do it. These people are destroying the church by destroying faith within the church. Secondly, false teachers do it to gain a following. They want people to follow them. They're seeking out a following. And they will distort the truth, he says, in order to draw a following. Now that wasn't true of Paul. Here's the great apostle Paul, a man who had spread the gospel from Antioch all the way through what we know today as Turkey, come down from Macedonia down into lower Greece, Acadia, down to Corinth and come back across to Ephesus and gone back and done a work there. And now the gospel is spreading all over that part of the world. So much so that Paul said, I need to go somewhere else. I've started to work here. I want to go start to work somewhere else. Here's this great apostle. And he writes in 1 Corinthians 1, 12 to 13, talking to the church of Corinth. Some of you are saying, I fo I'm followers of Paul. Others say, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. He says, has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. You see, when people want to get a following, that's a dangerous sign. You're starting to get into false teaching because I want a group to follow me. Dangerous on Facebook to have people follow you. They'll read some of your idiocy. The worst part is some of the idiots will believe it. But worse still, sometimes you start believing. False teachers deceive with confidence and ignorance. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 says this. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses. But they don't know what they're talking about even though they speak so confidently. They'll speak slowly and carefully and make sure you understand this word means this and this over here. And this was the concept here. And want you to understand these things. And they're very confident in the nonsense they're putting forth. And the best they can do is come up and say, I don't know whether there's a God or not. You don't know whether there's a God. Why don't you believe me? You don't know anything about it. Got to recognize they are confident, however, in their ignorance. There are some people that are so confident. Paul encountered folks like this. Like we call them Judaizers. They wanted the church in, to become Jewish. Not just Jewish, but they want you to follow the law of Moses. Paul encountered these many times, but particularly in, in Antioch, when he finished his first missionary journey with part of us. They came back, there was a group of people who came up and said, you know, unless Gentiles get circumcised, like it says in the law of Moses, you can't be saved. You got to be circumcised. That's in the Bible. That's always been the way it happened. You had to convert to Judaism. You got to do that. And they were contentious about that. Paul and Barnabas were standing up and saying, no, that's not true. 
You're saved by faith, not by the act of circumcision. Well, when they get down to Jerusalem, because the church said we need you guys to go down to Jerusalem and get this straightened out, is that really the truth? So they went down. By the time they got down, not only do you have to be circumcised, but you've got to keep the whole law of Moses. You can't be saved unless you get circumcised and you keep all the law of Moses. Not just the Ten Commandments, but everything Moses said. You've got to live. You've got to wear the right kind of clothes. You've got to let your hair grow long ringlets around the corner. You can't shave certain parts of your beard. You've got to let it grow. If you're going to be saved, you've got to look like that. And so the church of Jerusalem, we talked about this last week, said, nonsense. That's not the way God is saving the Gentile. And God, the Holy Spirit, has saved them, not us. And so when the word came back, they realized they failed. Well, they tried other tactics. They said, well, yeah, you've got to be saved by faith in Christ alone. But if you really want to live a holy life, you've got to follow the law. You gotta, you gotta follow the law. Paul writes the book of Galatians. The whole book of Galatians is apologetic against that. It's an argument against that. That's what apologetics means. It's giving the reason why that's nonsense. He says, "Who bewitched you? I've taught you this clearly. Who put the wool over your eyes to make you think that you can be saved by faith, but you have to be sanctified by your works?" Paul said, "You've been taken in by false teaching." You need to understand that. Later on, when he's writing to Timothy, there were people that were trying to spend an inordinate amount of time on things that Paul described as myths and endless genealogies. These things might have been true, they might not have been true, but even if they are true, they don't amount to it'll be different. It doesn't make a difference. Whether there was this person, he was related to this person this year, and that it doesn't make any difference. There's no practical difference. Good information maybe, but it's not worth spending your life on that. To be honest, when I hit those sections in the Bible, I read faster. I'm looking for is there something I'm not I know these are, I know I'm gonna meet these people in heaven, some of them. And I'll bone up then and I'll, I'll get the names then down, but I don't necessarily need to know all the details of that. I just know, I know where it is. If I need it, I'll go back and look it up. But I'm not going to commit that to that limited space I've got up here. I'm going to move on. I'm looking for key things there. But I'm moving on. Because it's not worse. But can you imagine a worse way to spend a quarter? Spend 12 Sundays going through the genealogies and chronicles and getting to the second at the end of those three months. That quote before I say more stuff than what I'm going to say. I, I visited one of those churches and I'm thinking we thoroughly covered the two and a half verses we were on. And the teacher announced we're going to go back next week and cover the same two and a half because there's a whole lot more there we didn't cover. And I'm thinking we covered everything we needed to. There's a whole lot more you're going to miss because you're not moving on. I can read the other at home. How do we prepare to be elders? How do we prepare for the onslaught of wolves? Let me suggest three things to you. We have to select the elders who take seriously the task the Holy Spirit has given them to guard, feed, and shepherd Bible Center Church. You've got to be looking for men that God will raise up and will say, I'm going to take responsibility for the souls of the people here because false teachers are coming. They're already in our world. They come into any home through the radio, television, internet, YouTube. Plus, you meet someone. We need men who are willing to say, look, that's not right. Secondly, these men have to know the Bible and the gospel message because that's essential to recognize an error. Not only do they have to know it, they've got to teach it to you because it's important for all of us. To know it does no good if I know there's a scam going around the community if I don't tell you because you might get sucked in by the scam and you say I didn't know that well I knew it but I didn't want to bother you well no that's not the way it should work once I was hired uh, for a week to 
work at the glass shop. That would tell you a whole lot. But for a week, I was hired to work at the glass shop. Uh, and the lady who, who had the shop, she showed me how to test crystal. No question, but she just took a piece of crystal and she just thumped it. And it rang. She said, that's how you know if it's real crystal. It's just glass. It doesn't have it. It's not going to ring. It's just boom. It's like, boom. It had to ring the truth. When you tested it, it matched the truth. When you hear something, you need to check it. Does it ring true with the Bible? Not just does it well, sort of sound like the Bible, but is that really what the Bible is teaching? If you're teaching that all you've got to do, no matter what illness you've got, no matter what it is, all you've got to do is visualize God healing you. Claim that healing, and you'll never die. You won't be sick any longer. Does that have to ring true? Well, you know, I can find a verse or two that's all seen that they were people that healed people. They all wound up dying. And there were a lot of people the apostles weren't able to heal. Is that the be all and end all of what God is teaching about the atonement? Is us getting physical healing? Us getting wealthy? No, it doesn't have the ring of truth. There's too many other passages that contradict the outcome of that teaching. Sometimes God wants to heal you. Sometimes he doesn't. If it doesn't ring true in all these situations, something is off about that. You've got to know the Bible. When you have a teacher that contradicts the truth, they're teaching falsehood. The same is true of a false prophet who predicts things that don't occur or calls people to worship other gods. Someone who claims to be an apostle but hasn't seen the Lord or doesn't teach the truth about Christ, humanity, and deity is false. And then finally, all believers, not just elders, learn from the previous generation how to counter the attacks that are coming. I told you these are not new. They're really all old. Fortunately, we have not only the writings of the apostles, in the New Testament, we know the apostolic doctrine is written down here. But in succeeding generations, as these errors came up in the church, there were men called the early church fathers, many of whom were apologists. That is, they took it as their mission to answer the charges of the Jews against Christianity, to answer the charges of people called the Gnostics, those who claim there's a level of knowledge you don't have. And you can go back and you can read those. A lot of this stuff has already been put together. There are men in the current generation who take it as their ambition to do apologetics. They, they're defending the cross, defending the answers. And you can watch them. Most of these guys are on YouTube along with the crazies. And you can say, oh, that's the answer to that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's nothing new out there. It's there. God has given us gifted men in the church to equip us to give the reason for the hope that's within us in the Word of God. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, I pray that there will be men among us who will take up this challenge. Lord, to be elders, to prepare to be elders, to shepherd the congregation, to look after the souls of other people as well as their own, Father, your truth might go forth from this church in succeeding generations. We might be able to reach out to those who have been deceived by error and to point out how they've been deceived and to point them to the truth that they also might live. Father, you say that it's not your desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, I pray that you'll use us as leaders of the church men of the church call people to repentance and to live the kind of life that is repentant and turns from our way and turns to your way. We praise you for this in Jesus' name.